Well, hello, viewers. Russ Barkley back again, having just made license plates over at the prison system. Obviously, given my prison work garb here, we're going to talk today about a special topic related to ADHD, and that is why ADHD is among the most treatable psychiatric disorders. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, well, let's take a look at the chart that I've prepared for you. And we're going to compare the treatments for ADHD to the treatments for other neurodevelopmental disorders first. And then I'll have something to say about some other psychiatric disorders as well. So let's have a look. Compared to other neurodevelopmental disorders, such as autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, Tourette syndrome, let's look at each treatment option to see where things stand in terms of treatability. In other words, how likely is the disorder to respond to that treatment? Or is there such a treatment even available? Take a look at medications, for instance. That's the first line here after the, the uh, titles. And you can see that there are many medications that have proven to be reasonably effective for managing the symptoms of ADHD. We have no medications that directly manage the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. Yes, there are medications that can help with some of the comorbidities, such as anxiety, to some extent, perhaps some of the OCD symptoms or some of the cognitive disengagement symptoms. All of these are sort of co-occurring disorders and certainly the seizure disorders that occur with autism spectrum as well. We have medications for those, but not for the major primary symptoms of ASD. The same is true with intellectual disability. We don't have medications that can improve or eradicate the deficiencies in general cognitive ability, known as IQ, in individuals with intellectual disability, or that can help improve the deficits in daily adaptive functioning in that disorder. And then finally, with Tourette's syndrome, which is, of course, multiple tic disorders with vocalizations, uh, that is, compulsive vocalizations, there are medications that can be used to treat tic disorders. They're not quite as effective as the treatments for ADHD. They're, we don't have as wide a range of medications for Tourette syndrome, but there certainly are medications there. So we're going to check one off for ADHD here as a more treatable condition. What about CBT, cognitive behavior therapy? There is a specific form of CBT developed for ADHD, primarily in adults, though it seems to be somewhat beneficial in older teens. And that is CBT that targets the executive functioning and self-regulation deficits in ADHD, the time management problems, the emotional self-regulation difficulties, problems with self-organization, and so on. There are training programs that, when added to medication, improve the beneficial effects of the medication and help with symptom control. So CBT especially targeting executive deficits, very useful for ADHD, particularly when it is combined with medication. Now, in no instance do the medications or the CBT eliminate the disorder. We're not talking here about an antibiotic for an infection that gets rid of the problem. But in terms of day-to-day -day management of the symptoms, CBT can be quite helpful for ADHD, particularly, as I said, in older teens and adults. We don't have a cognitive behavior therapy program that is especially effective for autism spectrum disorder, at least not to my knowledge. We certainly don't have one for intellectual ability, again, or intellectual disability. Uh, again, the point I'm making here is that we don't have a treatment like CBT that targets and directly improves the symptoms of ASD, ID, or even Tourette syndrome to the extent that CBT has been found to do for older individuals with ADHD. So again, check one off for ADHD. What about behavior therapy? Here I'm referring to the direct application of contingency management tactics 
to the individual with the disorder. And although there were early studies of behavior therapy being applied directly to ADHD children to reward them, to reinforce their behavior for paying attention, staying in their seat, getting their work done, and so on, it was found that these did not sustain after the treatment was removed, did not generalize to other situations for the individual, such as if they were applied in a clinic, they didn't generalize to the home environment, the classroom environment, and so on. They're very situation specific. They're also very person specific. They only seemed to help for the individual that was applying the contingency management approach to the child. And certainly no one that I know of has tried this with adults. In contrast, we have found that behavior therapy, particularly contemporary applied behavior analysis, has been helpful for reducing some of the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder, for improving the vocabulary and language uses, for usage that is for improving some of the social interaction difficulties with autism spectrum disorder. As you know, CABA, or what people call ABA, remains the most evidence-based treatment for autism spectrum disorder. Behavior therapy has been applied to individuals with intellectual disability, mainly to help improve their daily adaptive functioning and self-care. It doesn't do much, if anything, as you can imagine, for their intellectual deficits. And although behavior therapy has been tried to help manage tic disorders in individuals with Tourette syndrome, it appears to be very situation-specific, only helpful in the situation where it is being applied, and even then, only temporarily. So when it comes to behavior therapy, we have behavior therapies that are better for the other neurodevelopmental disorders, but don't seem to be all that great for ADHD. Parent training programs have been developed for various neurodevelopmental disorders, specifically for oppositional disorder and especially for ADHD, but they are not intended to improve ADHD directly. They're intended to improve parent-child conflict, oppositional defiant disorder, such as temper tantrums, outbursts, non-compliance, and so on. And for that, they do a very good job, but they don't address the specific symptoms of any of these neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, Although we do parent training for autism spectrum disorder, just as we do for ADHD, it's not really to improve the symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. However, within the past decade, a program developed by Geraldine Dawson called the Denver Early Start Program has been extended to a parent training program and does appear to have some benefits in helping to improve the symptoms of ASD in those children. But we don't have any such programs for intellectual disability or Tourette syndrome. So uh, the parent training program for ADHD, while it modestly improves ADHD, is more aimed at conflict, at defiance. And it can be extended to autism spectrum disorder to treat the same thing. But there does appear to be at least one or two specific parent training programs for ASD that can be helpful. What about classroom management? Well, you can apply classroom management strategies across these various disorders, but they have the greatest evidence for their effectiveness in managing the symptoms of ADHD and the downstream effects of ADHD on educational functioning in ADHD itself. So uh, much better classroom management efficacy for ADHD than for the other disorders. We certainly do classroom management for these other disorders, but they don't necessarily directly address the primary symptoms. Usually they're being used to address some other related behavioral or educational problems. So again, check for ADHD there over the other disorders. When it comes to adults, we know that adult ADHD coaching is increasingly having evidence for its effectiveness as a supplemental treatment to medication, to CBT, and to other programs for adults with ADHD. So uh, we don't have anything like adult 
coaching that has been shown to be a benefit to ASD, ID, or Tourette syndrome. Finally, physical exercise is also increasingly having evidence for its effectiveness in helping to cope with ADHD symptoms. And here we find that it does more for ADHD than it does for these other disorders. Sorry about that. My slides keep wanting to go backward here, probably because I'm touching the mouse over here incidentally. So, uh, but as you can see, if we look across this table, there's a lot more check marks for ADHD in terms of available and effective treatments for managing ADHD than there seems to be for these other three neurodevelopmental disorders. Now, let's compare the treatments for ADHD to treatments for other psychiatric disorders. I'm going to just choose anxiety and depression because they're very common. Uh, and let's compare the treatments for ADHD in those. First of all, we have a lot more medications available for ADHD, especially when we think about the different kinds of delivery systems we have. We have long acting, we have delayed acting, such as Journey PM that you take at night activates the next day. We have different forms of long acting delivery systems, pellet systems, osmotic pumps, and so on. We also have a skin patch for some of the ADHD medications, so you can wear the skin patch. We don't see anywhere near that range of delivery systems and medications for anxiety or depression. Second, when we look at the degree of improvement that the medications achieve, the medications for ADHD appear to be at, at least 50% to 100% more effective than the treatments for the other disorders. What do I mean by that? I mean, when it comes to the magnitude of changing the symptoms of ADHD, the stimulant medications in particular clearly outclass the effects of anti-anxiety and antidepressant drugs for those disorders. Some of those drugs for anxiety and depression are certainly effective. I'm talking here about the magnitude of improvement. Now, we can also take a look at the percentage of individuals who are normalized by medication. In ADHD, it's between 50 and 60% have their symptoms fall back down into the normal range when they're treated with an ADHD medication. We don't see that to that degree in anxiety and depression. We see improvement, no question about that, but not as much improvement and certainly not as much people being normalized by that medication. We also can compare the percentage of responders. Turns out that about 75% of the people given a single drug for ADHD show significant improvement from that medication. The degree of effectiveness that we see for anxiety and depression is around 50 to 60%, a little lower, pretty close, but a little lower than what we see for ADHD. However, when you try the different kinds of medications for ADHD, the percentage of people who respond can be pushed up to 85 to 93%. And we don't see that necessarily for anxiety and depression, at least not to my knowledge. So when it comes to the medications we have available, clearly we have much more available, more effective, greater likelihood of normalization, greater degree of improvement when we look at the medications for ADHD compared to medicines for anxiety and depression. And while we do have programs like CBT for anxiety and depression, probably nearly as good, if not equally as good as CBT for adult ADHD, we also have some programs related to parent training uh, and adult coaching for anxiety and depression uh, in children and in adults, of course. I'm speaking about the two different age groups here. Um, so overall, the number of treatments, the improvement that we see, the percentage of normalization, the percentage of responders, and so on, seems to be much greater for ADHD than even for anxiety and depression, although we do have some effective medicines for them too, 
along with effective forms of psychotherapy, such as CBT. So I hope you can see that. This is why you hear people like me and others often saying that ADHD is among the most treatable psychiatric disorders out there, and certainly the most treatable of the neurodevelopmental disorders. Well, I hope you learned something from this presentation. I thought it might be helpful to offer a lot of hope to those with ADHD and to their families that this is a highly treatable condition. And therefore, one needs to get busy, get diagnosed, get treated, because we can see a lot of gains from the treatments for ADHD, particularly across many different domains of functioning and the domains of daily life activity, such as home, school, work, driving, money management, social relationships, uh, crime, uh, increased risk for risky sexual activity. ADHD treatments affect all of those domains of functioning, and we don't see that with these other disorders to that degree. Okay, so I hope you found it useful. Please join me again later in the week for another presentation on ADHD. And as always, join me on Saturdays for my weekly research roundup on new research that I find to be worth commenting on. Okay, everybody, take care and be well.